Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast, a place where we focus on the business side of art to help you attract more customers, increase profits, and ultimately live a life of creativity and financial freedom. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and this week's episode features Dallas-based digital artist, Allo. He is an award-winning artist who creates minimal, abstract, and interactive art using AR. And in this chat, we talk all things NFTs and aim to keep it super simple for anybody wondering if the digital art world could be right for your art business. So let me know what you think about this week's episode all about NFTs with Allo. If we could start out by, if you want to tell everybody a little bit about your background and who you are and how you got into the art world. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been an art director and creative director and advertising for like 15, 20 years and just a workaholic. I won all kinds of awards from Emmys to Addies, everything in between. And I have always just had this creative bone in my body, right? Just to create and I was rooted in digital. And so about four years ago, decided I'm going to leave it all behind and started a a startup thinking I wasn't going to have any time to do any kind of art. And just had a little bit of, had a little bit more time at night and started painting this series called Masters, No Vowels, MSTRS. And it was interactive because I have this like digital, I have this right and left brain kind of thing that works. And I made interactive paintings and they're, augmented reality interactive paintings and it's really low-hanging fruit augmented reality but it just it just wows the crap out of people when they see it for the first time and because it was so digital in nature like i'm physically painting these pieces i'll actually bring one here into frame here in just a second but um i create these really minimalistic kind of abstract paintings and because they were so digital uh last march i had every single one of my collectors and friends and family just saying dude you have to get on these nfts and i had Not one crypto coin in my, I didn't have a wallet at the time. And starting March, just started taking all the pieces that I had and minting them as NFTs. And it just took off and was able to bring so many people into the space. So many other artists from March till about now, which is, it seems crazy to think it's almost been a year, have just been nonstop grinding and working because it's just so much fun that there's this new medium for art that we're playing in right now. It's crazy. Yeah, for sure. I know nothing about augmented reality art. So I have so (laughs) many questions. So you paint something in person and then you do what to it. So I paint these abstract pieces and this is actually a Van Gogh piece. What you can do is you'll hold up a phone and just like a Snapchat filter, it'll just recognize all of those panels and parts and pieces. And it flips it to the the original, the, the inspiration behind this piece. So this is in fact a Van Gogh. And what I do is I'll, I'll take a piece that this is one of his portraits. I'll print it out and draw all my favorite lines just with a ruler. Um, this is one of these things here, you know, just a ruler and I draw all my favorite lines. And what it does is it creates all of these wonderful, cool little triangles and panels. Then I'll zoom in on my computer and find my favorite color from that panel and start just building these new compositions based off of old, just What I like to think is we have all of these old images in our brain, everything from Marilyn Monroe's, you know, dress going up over the grate to all of these like masterpieces that we see in galleries all the time. And we've seen them a million times over, but then just to remake, to refresh them in a way that's kind of new. And then it uses like digital technology that maybe, you know, Vincent Van Gogh didn't have at the time. It's just been really fun. It started off as a study and it just blew up into this crazy phenomenon that's just overwhelmed me for sure. (laughs) <laughs> work-wise and experience-wise and everything. It's been so fulfilling. Very cool. Okay, so you create those paintings and then you take a picture of it and you put it online and that's making it into an NFT or... So yeah, so this <laughs> NFTs have been crazy. So I sketch online like many of us do these days. Yeah. And I had all of these illustrator files of these things that are that have been painted and this is acrylic on canvas, and it takes me forever to get these sharp, pointy edges and crispy lines. So I had all of these illustrator files, and from my early experiences at NBC, I, I kind of slumdog mo, you know, my way into this thing. Uh, I tell people all the time. But uh, my first job was at NBC Universal, and I, I was doing motion graphics, graphics news packages, and just everything. So I had a little bit of like 3D and graphic and motion graphic knowledge. So I took all of these pieces and I made these really cool card, these card flipping things that just said. I'm only going to mint one of these pieces. It's a one of one. Everything in my master series on foundation.app is a one of one. I'll never mint another one. So it's like, this is just like 
I'll never paint this piece again. And just started minting them and, and animating them. And they took off. And I soon became Foundation's number one selling artist and stopped uh, because I felt like it was too much of a rush and I wanted to slow down. So I stopped, reanalyzed my whole position and started focusing on bringing more artists in the space and made friends from all over the world, just who had been collectors and followers. I think I'm at almost 3,000 followers on Foundation, which is insane. Over 100 mints and sales on Foundation, which is insane. And it's just been life-changing. And since I've been bringing people on, it's I know I've changed the lives of just so many different artists and can talk about so many of those stories, but it's just been, I'm just couldn't be happier right now in my artistic career on top of everything else I do in, in my day-to-day life. But uh, yeah, it's been that crazy. Is- so cool. That's so inspiring. Okay. Let's go back on this because I, I can hear the questions of the artists who, who are listening to this. They're like, okay, that sounds great. Like I'm in, <laughs> let me try this. So basically you, you painted something in real life and then you put it into digital form and then you minted it, which means you basically just made it like permanent onto the NFT space. And sure. so I actually haven't made one yet, but I, I know the process of it. Very generalized though. So you minted a bunch of them. And then how did you get people to buy them? Like how, how did you get the word out? That's a good question. And, and feel free to ask anything. I know I, I talk in terms that are new to a lot of artists. And I know because I freak out a lot of my friends too, just my physical, my physical piece artists that I'm trying to get, bring onto the space too. But uh, yeah, so how did I... Who knows, right? Like, how do you sell your work? How do you sell yourself? It's really, it's marketing. It's being where, I always say this, right? Fish where the fish are. And in the NFT space, the digital art world space, they live on Twitter. And I didn't have a Twitter account until March just because it was just, I felt like it was news and it was too fast and it wasn't a creative space for me. I was on Instagram only. You know, after I left advertising, I just, I deleted all of my social media accounts just because I didn't want the distraction of it. Um, It was part of my job and just hated it secretly. And I still kind of hate it secretly now too, but it's a necessary (laughs) evil. You have to market yourself. And if you're going to market yourself in the NFT space, uh, you have to be on Discord and you have to be on Twitter. Okay. Okay. So that, yeah. that's kind of my like tie out too, because like I'm on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram and stuff. And I, and just like you, I was like, Twitter isn't really my thing. So I'm like, do I need to get on Twitter? And you're saying yes. So that answers that question. <laughs> okay. I'll also answer questions that I'm looking at in, in your feed too, if you want. Happy to do that. Um, so what is an NFT? I can back up for just even artists that don't know, or just don't Please believe, do. or just don't understand what's happening. So an NFT really is just a new medium for artists to sell their work. Uh, If you think about printed canvas, if you think about sculpture, if you think about photography, these are all things that artists use as mediums to sell their work, their visions, their creations. And digital is just a new form of that. And the way I tell my mom is, yes, I'm selling a JPEG. Yes, I'm selling a video that you could right-click and save to your desktop. And you can keep and you can pretend that you have the ownership of that item. And what I tell my mom is, one of my favorite books is uh, Lord of the Flies. I read it maybe every other year. I spent maybe $20 on a copy of mine and I bought it because it's a cool cover and I like it. And there's a million other of those versions, right? Of Lord of the Flies. And everyone spent about 12 to $20 on their book. But somewhere out there in the world, someone owns a first edition Lord of the Flies. And that thing goes for 150000 in auction any day of the week. They don't have one more word than I have in my book. They don't have one more picture that I have in my book, but they own the ownership of the very first one that came from that artist's production. And so that's what a digital file is. And another way I I tell my gamer friends is they've already bought NFTs and they bought fungible tokens. So if you game and you bought a really cool skin for, you know, your avatar or your gun and you're like, oh crap, I got this really cool metallic gold gun. You bought a fungible token right there. You just didn't realize it because everyone else can buy that same gold metal gun, right? That's like chromed out and it's slick and everyone wants it. These, These are gamer talks, right? And I tell people all the time, imagine if Call of Duty only made one gold gun how expensive would that be if you bought it for twelve dollars and your friend really wanted that that skin for your digital gun like how much would they pay for that and they were like oh my god i get it that's a fungible token everyone can have it for twelve dollars but when you talk about non-fungible which means you can't duplicate it or you can't have that number one jpeg from that artist it becomes that much more rare so it's a collectible just like baseball cards are or just like any collectible there is right now whether it's stock or coin for in, for crypto okay. that makes sense Yes, yes. You described it in a very good way, I think, just to get it very like, so that we understand what it is in general, because it's, 
it's all very new still. Do you think it's still new or do you think like wh- where do you see the future of NFT? It is 100% brand new still. Like any <laughs> artist that hasn't dabbled into it like yourself that hasn't minted their first piece. Minting, by the way, only means that you serialize that JPEG. So if you look in the metadata, like if you were to look in the code, the, the geek stuff behind a JPEG, essentially there's a like a serial number that you've, of the, you've assigned to that JPEG that says, this is the one that came from my computer, the artist that made this JPEG. Everyone else can have a copy. You have the original. So when I say minting, that's what that means. And the cool thing about minting pieces is, it's, it's, I tell people this all the time, like, Everyone that downloads and saves that JPEG, just like the Mona Lisa, all the prints of all the Mona Lisas that we see in books and advertising everywhere, only makes my mint more expensive and more valuable because it, you know, is increasing the value of just who that artist is as, as an artist. So then it, the NFTs we make can be traded like stocks in a sense, right? That's exactly right. So an NFT is essentially just a collectible. Think about it as a baseball card. So Babe Ruth rookie cards, what are they, like 100 in the world maybe? I don't know, I'm talking out of my ass. But if they're 100, that means they're more valuable. So myself as an artist, every NFT that I mint for my Master Series is a one of one. There's never going to be a second one. So there are some of my NFTs that sold for almost $20,000 and then some that have sold for like 1000 just based on timing, based on when you were in the market, based on who really wanted that collectible because there's only going to be one ever. And if whoever wants to resell it, good for them, right? Like it's just, uh, just like this piece, if I wanted to sell it in gallery, it would go for anywhere from four to 6,000, but uh, I'm only ever going to paint the one. So if you wanted to be a collector and resell it, you're more than happy to, you're more than welcome to, but never again. It's the, it's the rarity factor. It's that collectible factor that makes them like cost and, and valuable. Very cool. So say I buy your NFT and then I sell it to someone. Do you get any kind of profit in the sale? Yeah. So that's, something that's completely different. So again, I I like talking about this because I talk about it all the time. If I sold this piece to Jay-Z, right, for $4,000 and next (laughs) year, Jay-Z sells that piece for 4 million, dude made almost 4 million on that piece, right? Minus $4,000 he spent on it. I'll never see a dime of that commission. I'll never see a percentage of it. But the, the beautiful thing about this new medium for artists is attached to that contract, right? That minting process when you minted that piece, every time it resells, you're allowed to take a percentage, whatever you dictate. Like I think uh, certain marketplaces will allow you to to massage it anywhere from 0% to 10%. But there have been times where I went to sleep, didn't mint anything, didn't market anything, didn't push anything, woke up and had a few thousand dollars in my wallet because something had resold on a secondary market. So it's just wild that we finally, as artists, Unlike, you know, what musicians and writers and actors have been doing for years, where every time you stream something, whether it's on Spotify or Netflix, they get a percentage of that, you know, that stream. Us physical artists, us tangible artists have never gotten that in the history of art. It's just, I sell it and the reseller makes 100% of whatever they sell without giving me a cut of that commission. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we we can set the original price and, and we set the percentage of at which they would sell it at. That's correct. Yeah. Certain marketplaces have it fixed. Some you can massage it and you can move that like dial around to, you know, to give your reseller more of that percentage and and do less or do more, however you feel comfortable. Okay. I gotcha. I'll go back to that question you asked earlier. Is it, what's the future? I saw a really cool meme the other day where uh, it was talking about web one, web two and web three. I know this is all dorky, like nerdy. I love it. Keep going. Yeah. (laughs) So web one, the way they describe web one is you go to a website and you enter your username and your password, right? That's how you sign in. And that, so let's just say your website, right? If I wanted to sign in and buy something from you, you could set up a username and a password. And that just means that you hold all of that data, all of that information for that person. You are the holder of everything that is your customer, right? Okay. Web two changed a little bit and you see this everywhere. Web two is where... You can sign in with Google. You can sign in with Facebook. And you can sign into all of your new sites. But guess who has your data still? It's either Google when you clicked it or it's Facebook when you clicked it, right? It's that single sign-on. That's very web too, right? I can sign in on all of my accounts with my Facebook account if I wanted to. But Facebook ultimately still holds all of my information. Web3 is different. When you go to a Web3 site, you'll see connect to my wallet. When you hit connect my wallet, that's everything that you have in coin. That's everything that you have in your NFT collection. That's anything that you've built yourself. 
And for the first time ever, as us as users get to hold all of our information. If I want to connect my wallet to your account, to your website, I can do that for the first time ever. So when you hear like web one, web two, web three, that's kind of what they're talking about. It's like, it's, you know, it's the idea of like, I'm taking away ownership of any company and I'm owning it myself for the first time ever. So there's a lot of big time first things happening. So when we talk about, are we in the cusp or are we in the beginning of all of this digital like NFT revolution? 100%. We're still super early. In the near future, we're all going to have wallets in five years. We're all going to have NFTs. We're all going to have digital content and we're all going to own our own content and our own information. And we're going to be able to say, I want to give permission to this company to have it. I want to give permission to this. And no longer will Facebook or the Googles just hold everything for us and market us and sell us like, you know, they have been for the last 15, 20 years. Sounds so freeing. I love it. (laughs) Okay. So say I want to make an NFT and say people who are listening want to. So we are artists. Yep. So we we have a bunch of, of art laying around or or photos of past stuff that we've created from the past couple of years. Is it as easy enough as I take a photo of a painting that I have right here that I just completed, upload a JPEG and then mint it or? Yeah, it is. It really is that easy. So like I said earlier, I, I had all of these sketches, right? All these illustrator files that were sketched out. And I didn't want to just upload JPEGs. I wanted to give them a little bit more, you know, it's an NFT. And what I tell artists all the time, because it's so easy to like put something up, I think it's up to us to slow down and make sure that it's going to be something that you're going to be proud of in about 10 years. Okay. Because block, whatever you meant gets written to the blockchain and that stuff's going to stay forever. And I can see it being very embarrassing in, the, in 10 years from now, the stuff that everyone's <laughs> oh. been making. So. <laughs> Once it's there, you can't take it down. So take your time, relax. But it is as easy as taking a JPEG, a photo that you took on your phone, something that you digitized, like a, a physical piece that you've digitized, whether through photography or a scan, a high-res scan. You can go to a site without any code needed, without any dorkiness or nerdiness needed. You can upload it, hit the mint button. Everything happens on the back end. And it does cost money. Everything, Every transaction you do costs money, depending on the blockchain that you're writing to. So it's not cheap. Uh, like if you're going to sell something with, and we can go into like the dorkiness and we can have a part two of this if you wanted to get deeper. Uh, yeah. But if you wanted to mint in the Ethereum blockchain, it does cost money. It costs about $150 to mint something and then $100 to list something. Oh, so wow. for about okay. 250 you can, you know, gamble on yourself. You can, you can put something to a, uh, to a marketplace and see if it sells. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So if I were to take a picture of a painting that I have, and then I, I could add a, like some movement with it to so say, say there's like those apps, right. That, that you can like make things move and like make the clouds move. And so that was my plan. Is it, is it as easy as that? Just to kind of add a cool painting and then have it have some kind of like motion to it and then put it up. 100%. Yeah. That, in <laughs> fact, you know, there's been a big push in the NFT space for photography, but I, I don't know why photographers don't get as much credit as they should. You can go to a gallery and you'll see photos, like really badass photos. Photos I, I buy photography because I, I can't shoot. And I always admire people who can write because I can't write and people who can shoot because I can't shoot. I can pick a great headline, but I can't <laughs> write one myself. Uh, this is my advertising speaking. Yeah, in, in the NFT space, motion does a little bit better from what I can tell. I have all kinds of tips and tricks. If you want to follow me and ask away, I'm, I'm open for anything and follow me on Twitter or Instagram. But yeah, I would definitely add some motion. Those tend to do a little bit better in sales and it was. Okay, great. So, and then I would upload it to, there's one, what is it? Ocean, which one is o- it? OpenSea. <laughs> Open yes. Is, is that yeah. the one you use or you use a different one? So I started on foundation. Foundation is a little trickier to get in. It's uh, invite only. So the, the art tends to be a little more selective, a little more higher end, upscale, yeah, something like that. OpenSea and Rarible are kind of the big marketplaces where you can go and anyone can sign up for an account and mint stuff. So as you can guess, there's going to be a lot of fuss there. There's going to be a lot of things and it's always moving, not as curated. And the art may be not as inspiring, but you'd be surprised what sells. It's, it's incredible, the space. Okay. If I were to shout to my Instagram and, and Facebook and TikTok followers be like, I just put something up there. Do you think it's possible to sell something via that way if you already have an audience on these places? Or is it like we we need to get into Twitter and build up that Twitter following? No, you could definitely you could just st- still market in the places where you're, you know, dominant. And I think you would help yourself a lot if you got onto Twitter. I think most NFT okay. and crypto kind of investors are and collectors are in on Twitter. 
Okay. So do I tweet at those? So I you do not use Twitter at all. So I'm like, do I tweet at certain groups that are about NFTs and like share my stuff or share their stuff? And is that how you grow on Twitter? Different roles. Yeah. You'll get your hand slapped a lot. Um, it's <laughs> called sh- in Twitter, it's called, or in the space, it's called shilling, you know, selling your work. There's a term called shilling. And you're allowed to do so much of it. And then after that, people are like, dude, please stop shilling your work. Just like be a community member, be part of the movement versus like me, 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 sell my work, sell my work, sell my work. So it is a lot more communal, I will say. I've helped so many people and have received so much help, whether through hooking me up with a developer or another artist or just promoting your own work. It's so much more of a community that I've ever felt in any artistic world that I've experienced, whether it's an advertising commercial, you know, like conglomerate style thing where everyone's at each other's throats. Uh, even in the gallery life, as you know, probably, it's just hard to get into a gallery. It's it's hard to nudge someone for a good space in a gallery. Um, the NFT space is not like that. It's the most welcoming community that's ever been started in the art world that I've ever been. There's no I mean, there's some egos, but for the most part, there's no egos. There's no, I mean, it's just, it's been wonderful space over the past year. Very cool. What's the most you've sold something for? It depends on, you know, how ETH is doing, but maybe five ETH, I think, which is uh, Ethereum at the time was almost $20,000, probably what an NFT is. What? Oh my gosh. That's amazing. But you know, it's like anything else, right? It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's clout, but it, a collector will look, find your work, you know, they'll see it. They'll start to dig around. They'll start to look at your Instagram to see if you're a legit artist and you've been around for a while. They'll start to see what your other pieces have sold for. They'll start to see, you know, what you have in the pipeline as far as what you're projecting or what you're going to be doing next. Um, so it's nice to be vocal. I have a ton of projects that are happening all simultaneously right now. So I, are, I honestly like to be somewhat of an underdog. So I don't, promote all of the projects that I'm doing a hundred percent until my own fault sometimes. But what's fun is when a collector will start digging around and say, Oh my, Oh my God, you're doing all of this shit. This is insane. How do you have time? And I, I truthfully don't sleep. It's just been, like I said, it's been nonstop since last March. It's been really fun. It's been really fun. Market where you are. There's NFT collectors on Instagram. I mean, I was selling a, a shit ton of NFTs on Instagram before. I mean, I don't even have that big of Twitter following now. I just don't tweet that much. I, I should, be doing a better job tweet, tweeting more. Okay. Okay. So I, I was thinking just to get it started, I was thinking about putting out maybe like 10 NFTs and getting them minted. But I was just, I was planning on just having, just having the price for the cost of the mint or, or basically having, having the buyer mint it for me. So I wasn't out anything just to get the first, like maybe 10 and maybe get some, start to get an audience and then start to sell them after that. Do you, what, What's your thought on that approach or should I just start charging from the, the bat? Yeah, you know, I've had a lot of pricing conversations around work. And frankly, I don't buy into any one sort of knowledge. Big ones are though, just like everything else in pricing, it's hard to price up once you've sold something, right? Like if you were to sell a mural for $500, there's no way you could charge probably what you charge for your murals after that, right? <laughs> because you've already set that playing field down here. Okay. Um, you you might want to think about that NFT wise also, I and mean, it's your work, right? And yeah. you're never going to remake that. That being said, does it take a lot longer to make produce? No. And so there's that thought too, where it's like, dude, you already had the digital files. You just upload it. You minted it. Like it was, you already had it on your machine. It's like no cost. Everything's profit at that point. But if you think about branding yourself, that's the one I believe the least because it still took time to develop that look, that style, your signature, you know, all of that stuff. I think that all has value. And I think you have to value yourself in the NFT space and not look at it as a place where I'm just going to make some extra Ethereum or some extra whatever, right? Solana, whatever, you know, blockchain you want to mint on. So I do, I, I value my work. However, that being said, I like to undervalue it on on foundation just so that there's like, I, I want people to collect my work, honestly. And so like even my work, like I have prints all the time. I have some prints over here. I don't price them out of the realm of people collecting them because I remember when I was young, I didn't have a lot of money and I liked work and I would always want to collect pieces. And I want to be, I want to be a lot of people's first pieces, first ownerships. 
And I carry that into Ethereum or in my NFTs as well. So I start all of my bidding on foundation at 0.1552. It's about $300. And okay. uh, 0.1552, 1,552 is my grandmother's favorite number. She passed away about 10 years ago, but I use it for everything. Anyone who's ever worked with me knows that's just the number. You know, if I'm putting a price, it's $15.52 or it's 1,552 somethings. She always said that's how many grandkids she had. And she really only had like 50, but crazy woman. But uh, so I, I priced them all at about $300. And you can tell that like, some have sold for 20,000 and some sold for 500. It's just, you know, depending on what the collector is willing to pay for an NFT. Okay, so do people bid on it or do you just set it and they pay 20000 for it? Or So every marketplace is a little different. You can set it up to start a bid on OpenSea. Most of the time on an open, on the, on an OpenSea NFT, uh, you just mark it for sale and that's what you want and you get to sell. Foundation.app is it's auction only. So you set that initial bid and then the 24-hour shot clock starts. So for 24 hours, anyone can bid on your NFT. And after that 24 hours, that's it. But what's really cool about Foundation, unlike eBay's auctioning, is uh, and within that last 15 minutes, if someone puts a bid, 15 minutes resets. So there's no sniping. You can't just wait to the last second and snipe like a really cool Murakami piece or something, you know, for like dirt cheap or a visualized value piece for certain dirt cheap. You, uh, it'll reset that clock for for 15 minutes. And so... The piece that I sold for uh, five, almost five ETH was a Muhammad Ali piece. And I had two whales just going at it back and forth. And I, I just remember like I was with my son at my brother's house and he was coming down the stairs and he was watching the bid war happening because it was like they were just going back and forth. And we were, I was literally crying. I mean, I'd never sold a piece for that much physical. Well, murals maybe is different, but I'd never sold a piece for that much, much less a digital piece for that much. And which just, I was uh, messaging the whale back and forth on Twitter. We were commenting and just how much I was just so grateful and how much he's just changed the course of, you know, my life and my family's life. And so, yeah, we've become good friends and yeah, it's been wild. That's so amazing. So these collectors that buy, so they just find out about you through, through the groups on Twitter and through, or through the communities and whatnot. So just, getting in and being active within the art NFT community, you end up meeting people. How, how are you active? So you just comment on people's stuff or tweet at them and like compliment them or like, what is it? I'm in Twitter spaces a lot. Twitter spaces are, I guess they're like uh, lives here on Instagram with no video. It's kind of like, uh, what was that? The video, the audio only. Oh, like Clubhouse. A, Clubhouse. Thank you. So NFT started in Clubhouse, and then once Twitter had spaces, it just kind of all, for the most part, moved to spaces. And so every night uh, when I'm at the gym just walking, I'm either on a space listening, and I'll get pulled up to the stage because I'm getting a little bit of name recognition, which is kind of cool. And then from there, you just get some follows, and you get a bunch of questions about the projects you're working on, and you just get to talk about things you're working on or things you need help on. And everyone's there to help. Like I said, it's, it's been one of the most beautiful communities I've been a part of. No, I'm in a lot of the same spaces every night. Uh, one of them is, is this guy named Lucas Bean. He's a good friend of mine from LA. Again, never met him, right? We're just friends via digital, via social, and via NFTs. No, we just talk shop. We just talk shop all day. It doesn't matter whose projects are up. And we just like to look at work and grade work and talk about work and buy into projects and flip them and do all kinds of DJ and stuff. It's pretty crazy. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah, this, is, this sounds like a whole nother thing. So it, it sounds like... I've talked to a lot of artists about it that kind of want to just come on and make some extra money. But it sounds like if you really want to get into it and do well with it, it needs quite a bit of time like attached to that, right? It needs time and it needs commitment. Like I said, I, I think what NFT collectors are getting better at is kind of filtering out the fly-by-night, the projects that they call it getting rugged, where an artist will come in, they won't dox themselves. They won't say like who they are in person. So there's a little bit of like, who's behind this project? There's some anonymity to it because it's the web, right? And people will buy in and they'll, they'll rug the project or they'll just take the cash and just leave, right? Whereas I've always been doxxed. I've always said, no, this is my work. This is my face. This is my name. I'm not going anywhere. And so that gives a little bit of credibility too. So just being in the space, talking about it, just knowing that you're going to help someone else out. I've bought into a lot of projects. Uh, like I said, I've, I've brought in artists and literally like have made millionaires from the, the projects that I've brought on because Gary V found one or one of my, like the first person I brought on, 
uh, not a mouse, like one of the biggest NFT sellers in India right now. I mean, he's just killing it. It's, I mean, it's insane. And so just bringing people on is just, uh, it's been kind of my big push because it's just a, I love looking at art and I love collecting art. My house is a gallery and my wallet's no different. Like I collect art because I like it, not necessarily because I want to flip it and make money off of a bunch of people's work. Yeah. Very cool. And I heard uh, Gareth told me that Gary V is following you on Instagram or Twitter one. Yeah, it's nuts. So uh, another person I brought on, her, her name was Barbara Ale. I'll keep this story really, really short. Her name is Barbara Ale. She's from Russia. And, you know, because I did so well on foundation, they give you invites. And so I had a few to give away. And I just put on Twitter, like, giving away an invite for anyone who's got some incredible art. Mind that. you, people. <laughs> yeah, DM me. I'll hook you up. And mind you, like people were selling invitations for thousands of dollars, thousands. And I'm like, this, this it was given to me for free and it's part of a community. I'm not going to sell my invites. And so I famously have given them away to artists that are, I think are just insanely talented. A lot of Dallas artists as well. And uh, so I brought Barbara on and she had this project and I loved it. Actually, she sent me this piece. This is her work. I have to get it framed. I put it here so I can remind myself, but this is kind of her work. Wow. And it's just beautiful. And this smells like fresh ink. Very you know, different um, and edgy. I love it. Love her work. And so <laughs> I, I gave her the invite and paid to put her first, mint her first piece, paid to list it. I think I can put the first bid. If you look at her very first thing, it, she actually uh, started the auction for, for 0.1552 uh, in honor of my grandmother. So it was really <laughs> kind of touching. And so I just kind of followed her work and collected a few of her NFTs. Well, she had this big project. She had her first, you know, 10,000 piece project called Flower Girls. And it's all women of different shades and colors. And they're kind of like perfectly imperfect and just beautiful collection. And she had this tweet and I just said, hey, Gary Vee, you should check this shit out. It's one of the dopest projects I've seen. And that next morning, Gary and his brother had purchased over $200,000 of her work. She woke up and had the, one of the best GMs ever. And her project that launched maybe a month later sold out in 30 minutes because Gary was behind it. And so uh, literally it was like 2.6 million she made off of her project. And like, like I said, we were DMing each other on Twitter. We were both just crying for her. And I was like, I, I couldn't be happier for this woman because she is an, probably one of the best artists I've ever seen. And so it's just to be able to you know, through no fault of my own, I, I won't take any credit. I mean, I brought her on, I, I DM'd Gary and they started connecting and he followed back. And just to know that he's kind of listening and following that dude's just got his pulse on so many great artists in this world, uh, has the chance at a flip of a tweet just to make someone's life different, like changed forever. That's what happened to her. And uh, again, really cool project. Like she, the, the utility behind her project was that she was going to invest in a bunch of uh, youth projects, youth NFT projects. And she's held her word. She's purchased into so many different NFT projects for kids. And it's just been a, a freaking crazy, beautiful, insane story. It's just insane. That's crazy. amazing. Okay. So I've heard that before. Like a lot of people want to buy art that's also connected with a cause or something that they can, you know, g- give back to. Is that what most people do or? So yes and no. So it's called utility. And The utility behind a project can be anything from, hey, I just want to make something just to sell it as art. And it could be something that's more communal where it's like, hey, we're going to create comic books and videos and webisodes out of all of this art that you're buying into. Or it can be something like you're donating to a cause. Like I would love to do a project with my nephew who's on the spectrum. He's very high function, but he's super artistic. I want to do a project with him sometime this year. You know, I'm going to get him an iPad and have him start sketching and produce all of this wonderful work. And I want to give like 50% of all of our proceeds to like autism and creativity for autistic children. So like there can be some really good utility around things like that. One of my favorite projects, it was really early on. I don't know how well they did. I have to look them up. But uh, you could buy these like 3D digital trees and their utility was they would plant a tree and give you that GPS location. And so you, every entity you bought planted a tree somewhere and you could keep up with it and track it and do all kinds of great things. So the world is your oyster, right? As far as what you want to do with your projects and what you want to do with your art to give more utility, to give back to the community. But like I said, NFT is a community. You have to be here. You have to be present. You have to be very vocal as far as what you're going to doing, what you say you're going to do and just giving back as much as you can, because we're all just building this together. And it's been really, really fun. 
I love that. So I am just eating up everything you're saying, especially about the whole artist being a community type thing, because that's one thing that I've always tried to like combat and like try to get through like the whole image of the starving artist or the, the artist that just is, is alone in their studio and keeps all the, all their secrets to themselves. Cause there still are some artists that like, like they, they don't want to share some information because it could be, you know, competition. But in the artist academy, we, of all, like for, we started about three years ago, and that's our big thing: community over competition. And so that, like, I haven't, I hadn't yet had anybody tell me that on Twitter and in the NFT space, everybody is really helpful. So that's like my extra push of like, all right, this is this could be a really cool space. Incredible community, like I said, <laughs> and we just launched a project that's called Project Tools. P R J C T, no vowels. Everything I do has no vowels, so it's masters, minimals, and project. But project.tools, if you have an idea, like, you know, I have this idea, a concept for an NFT, and I just don't know how to develop it, or I don't know how to do this artistically, we have a form, you can fill it out, we kind of judge them, and we're starting to hand select a few projects that we're just going to build for free for, with a percentage, right, of just whatever the project is, but uh, for free to, to artists, for anyone who has just a great idea that hasn't been done before, right, like nothing, it's just a brand new space, so it's, it's been pretty cool. I love that you have my wheels turning. I'm like, oh, I could do this. And then I could link it with that. And like, <laughs> yeah, there's just so, so many ways to go about that. But I think that's about all we have for today. That unless there's anything else that you want to add on to it. You've already said so much and we so appreciate you just filling us in on this new world. I feel like it flew by this time. I feel like we didn't nearly scratch enough. Some of the questions. So yeah, happy really? to do this again if you want. We could Yeah. Actually I would love to have you as a guest in, inside of our artist academy group to really like go down and maybe break down like how to make an NFT and then how to maybe promote it and then just all of the the little details in there. I would love to talk to you outside of this about coming into the artist academy and doing this. My pleasure. I'd love to. And if anyone has any questions, just DM me. I'm always on. So just DM me and we'll figure it out. Awesome. Yeah. So the, uh, the best way to contact you is via Instagram or Twitter. And what's your handle for anybody listening? Instagram. It's I think it's allo.art on Twitter. It's alloart3. Alloart3. I don't know. Uh, just okay. see me on Instagram. I'm, I'm more, either, you know, one of those I think are, are good. And then from there, we can figure out all of the projects I have going. I mean, it's been crazy. Perfect. We will be watching and rooting you on. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. I really appreciate it. And hope you have yeah, a great rest yeah. of your day. Yeah, likewise. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Artist Academy podcast. And if you like hearing interviews just like this in your ear, if they inspire you, then I want to encourage you to go download the audible version of my new book, Mural Money. It's a condensed version of basically all of the best of the best tips given here on the podcast from guests, plus my own words of wisdom to help you get started in any art industry, plus stories of some hard lessons learned that I have never told before. You can pick up a copy at muralmoney.com. And again, I highly recommend the Audible version. I put a lot of tender love and care to make sure the Audible was extra special and had some extra goodness in there. And it's really for any artist, but especially those wanting to make a profit from a paintbrush. Muralmoney.com. That's it. I'll see you next week.